So we have the second lecture of André Barato. Uh, there was a change in the program, you see. So he will speak also Thursday and Friday. So no, it's, uh, you can go, André. Thanks. OK, thank you. Um, so that's where I stopped last time. There was this three-state model, right? It, this was a single enzyme. Again, okay, the experiment would be you put the single enzyme in a recipient, OK? So this thing here. It's the recipient, there should be maybe water there. So you put the single enzyme in the water and then you have uh, substrate S and product P. Substrate could be ATP, okay? And product could be ADP plus PI. ATP is adenosine 3-phosphate, I guess everybody knows that. And the enzyme is constantly consuming the blue thing S and producing the red thing P, all right? And the idea is that uh, the concentration of S and P are fixed either because you know the number of S and P is so large that whatever the enzyme is doing does not really significantly alter the concentration of S and P, or you know there could be some external thing that uh, keep giving S to the solution and taking P out. Okay, both both schemes would work, but the idea is that these concentrations are fixed. The three states of the model for so the chemical reaction is this one here, where E plus S becomes the S, then the enzyme transforms S into P, and then the enzyme releases the product into the solution. Okay, that would be the fourth reaction. The reverse reaction is also possible, although less likely. And you know, if I want to do a representation of this model, the, there are three possible states. Again, the plus S and plus P have to do with the solution, so that the state of the solution, which is the reservoir, it's not really, does not really matter. We are interested in the state of the system. Um, and, you know, there are three possible states. One could be E, two could be S, three could be EP. Um, that's the probability of the system. P of T is the vector. That would be the stochastic matrix W, right? And the master equation would be DP of T dt is equal to W P of T, okay? And you know, I mean, I can I can solve this master equation. That's not so hard. It's just a three by three system. I could, for example, find a station distribution, right? PS. Andre, can you try to write with the bold bold pen? Can be write with what? Can you try to write with the pen which is in more bold? Sure, maybe. This one is better. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Okay, I don't know exactly what you can see here, yeah, sure. Okay, so, I mean, I would have a stationary solution, PS, you know, which should be the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue zero. Okay, that's something I can calculate. It's gonna be a function of all these transition rates. So it would be a function of, uh, of uh, six different variables which I'm circulating, right, okay? So, you know, that, that would be my stationary solution. Again, that's the eigenvector related to zero, okay? To the eigenvalue zero. Okay, so that's a calculation I can do. And then there will be two possibilities that this is gonna be equilibrium or non-equilibrium, right? I mean, um, and as we see, I mean, equilibrium would mean that, you know, P, I, S, W, I, J is equal to P, J, S, W, J, I. Okay, that's gonna be if is equilibrium, all right? And I mean, for this model here, I just have a single current, okay? Let's think about the probability current going in the clockwise direction like this, okay? So I'm going from one to two, from two to three, and then from three to one, all right? So this current could either be J12, which will be P1S, W12 minus P2S W21. Okay. And this current is going to be different than zero if non equilibrium. Okay. So, again, if you give me the rates, I can solve this equation, whatever the rates are. And uh, I can tell you whether it's an equilibrium or a non equilibrium steady state, depending on what these rates are. And if it's a non equilibrium steady state, I'm going to have a current. And if it's an equilibrium steady state, I'm not going to have a current. Now, what does it mean to have a current here? Well, to have a current means that, you know, it is more likely to do this chemical reaction from left to right, right? To take the product, the substrate S 
and taking the product P. So having a current means I go in the clockwise direction, meaning I'm consuming S and producing P. If there is no current, the likelihood of going from for for I mean when I say going from left to right, I'm talking about this equation here. Okay. That would be going from left to right. And this would be going from right to left. Okay. So you know if if I am in equilibrium, it simply means that the likelihood of going of consuming the substrate is the same as the one of consuming the product. Okay, so in equilibrium would mean that the chances of of producing a P or producing an S would be the same. And um, if I'm out of equilibrium, normally I would be consuming the substrate and producing the P, so I'm more likely to go from left to right. Okay. So that's the current, and I mean, it's not very hard to show. That's something you can try to do alone. That you know, if I calculate j two three and j three one, they are all the same. Okay, so basically, j one two will be equal. That again, oh, to the j three one. Okay, and if you look, that just means that you know, I, I mean, I just have a single current in this model in this cycle here. Okay. That's, I'm talking about this thing here. So I just have a single current here. This current is going the clockwise direction. And the current in each link must be the same because of Kirchhoff law. Okay? The current can, there is only one cycle and the current is conserved. Okay. And you know, you, you can deduce this equation from the fact that sum in J, J, I, J is equal to zero. Okay. That's an equation we had before. That's an equation that must be true in a non equilibrium steady state. Now let's think about this physically. What does it mean to be in equilibrium? I mean, what does it mean that I can go from left to right? The likelihood of going from left to right is the same as going from right to left. I mean, the physical condition that must be true will be that the chemical potential, the thermodynamic force that drives here is the chemical potential mu. Let's write this down. So physically, well, okay, let me change the name of the section. So. Now there is something very important in stochastic thermodynamics called generalized detailed balance. Okay, now this is a bit of a strange name. Sometimes it's called a generalized detailed balance condition. This is not really a condition, rather it's like a postulate in stochastic thermodynamics. So this is actually a postulate. Okay. Again, this is if you see stochastic thermodynamics as some sort of phenomenological theory, probably the postulates would be that, you know, the Markov dynamics would be maybe the first postulate, if you will. Uh, the other postulate would be that, uh, I would say the second one is probably that the transition rates fulfill generalized state balance, which again, is not really a mathematical restriction, rather it's a relationship between transition rates and physical parameters like chemical potential, temperature, external forces, and so on and so forth. And uh, probably the other one would be the definition of entropy, which we're gonna discuss also here together with generalized state balance, okay? But let's think about this model. And now what I wanna do is to just explain what's generalized state balance for this model, this particular model of a single enzyme, okay? So we are gonna do this for the single enzyme case. And you know, it won't be so hard to imagine what it should be in the general case. Um, the other thing I want to do is to see that the you know the the definition of of uh, entropy change of the environment in stochastic thermodynamics for this particular model of a single membrane is going to be consistent with the entropy that you learned or you should have learned in your thermal physics course, okay? And so that's what I want to do in this section. So let's first think about what does it mean to be out of equilibrium. Being out of equilibrium means that there is a a, lie, a, a bigger likelihood of doing this thing, okay? That is this one that I'm calling going from left to right all the time. So, and then there is the other one, which would be E plus P going into EP. That would be the reverse reaction, okay? So again, the black one would be the Ford reaction and the purple one would be the reverse reaction, right? Now, if I'm in equilibrium, again, the likelihood of both of them is the same, meaning I have no current, okay? If I have no current, then I, I neither go in the clockwise direction nor in the anti-clockwise direction in this figure of, in this cycle here. So remember. Okay. 
E, okay? So, you know, if going from left to right in the chemical reaction is the same as going from right to left, then that means there is no current there in this, in this, in this cycle. Okay, so what is the physical thing that makes me go from left to right? Well, it's the chemical potential difference. So if mu s is larger than mu p, mu being the chemical potential, okay? So if mu s is larger than mu p, then of course, I mean, I tend to take the more energetic molecule, which is S, and I tend to release the less energetic molecule in the solution, all right? Um, and so if mu S is larger than mu P, I'm more likely to do the chemical reaction from left to right than I am for the, than I'm more like than the, the reverse one from right to left, okay? Um, and equilibrium here would mean that mu S is equal to mu P, okay? That would be equilibrium, all right? So you know the the I could imagine a case where mu p is larger than mu s, but then it would be strange to call p product. Probably would call p s, and then it would call the s p. Okay, the name substrate is typically something you consume, and product is something that you produce. All right, and so just to have an idea, you know, if we are talking about ATP again, that would be you know, delta mu <laughs> equals to mu s minus mu p. So if you are talking about ATP in physiological conditions, so if substrate is ATP and product is ADP plus PI, that is going to be something like 20 kBT, okay? More or less, I mean, that's something, that's a good order of magnitude for what you should get for ATP. In physiological so, you know, if you are in physiological conditions, then the thing that drives you out of equilibrium, so if you put an enzyme there with ATP and DP and PI in, in concentrations that would correspond to more or less what we have in our body, uh, the delta mu would be something like 20 kBT. And again, KB is one in this course. I'm just writing KB here because it's convenient, but most of the time, again, KB is one, okay. Okay, so that would be the delta mu for typical value of ATP, okay. And that's the force that drives you um, out of equilibrium, okay, the delta mu. Delta mu is the force that produces a current in the cycle, okay. Delta mu is the thing that's going to produce this cycle current here. All right. Now, the question is generalized state balance is something that's going to give you a relation between delta mu and the Ws. Okay. I mean, the important thing here, delta mu, the chemical potentials are a property of your external reservoir. These are physical thermodynamic parameters, the standard thermodynamic parameters, okay? Like chemical potential, temperature, and so on and so forth. The transition rates are these kinetic parameters you have, but the transition rates cannot be anything. They're related to these thermodynamic parameters associated with the reservoir, okay? And the generalized state balance condition established these relations. It's a postulate in thermodynamics that connects the transition rates with the thermodynamic parameters of the external reservoir. Again, remember in, in stochastic thermodynamics, my system can be out of equilibrium, but my reservoir is big, okay? My reservoir cannot be small. The system can be small and the reservoir must be in equilibrium. And the relationship is that if I do a cycle, so think about the cycle E going to ES, going to EP, going back to E, okay? So I'm imagining this cycle here. So there are two ways of drawing that. This is one, the other one would be, again, when I'm doing that, I'm not doing the chemical reaction thing. I'm just drawing the states, okay? Okay, so I imagine this cycle here in the clockwise direction. Huh? And now I'm calling this state one, this is state two, and this is state three, okay? So if I think about the product of the transition rates, which would be W12, W23, and W31 in the cycle. And then I think about the reversed cycle and the product of the transition rates for the reversed cycle would be W21, W32, and W13, okay? So one is the product of the transition rates for going from the cycle one to three. That's what I have uh, above. And what I have below is the product of the transition rates from going to the, through the cycle one, three, two, one. 
okay? And that must be equal to e to the power of beta delta mu. This thing here is what connects transition rates with the thermodynamic parameters of the reservoir, okay? That's the, this thing here is the generalized detailed balance. Okay. <clears throat> so again, very important relation. It's typically called the condition. It's not really a condition. Uh, th there is a more general way of writing it, okay? It's, it's, but it's not really a mathematical restriction in your stochastic process. It's more, again, a physical interpretation of transition rates. It's a physical connection between uh, thermodynamic properties of your reservoir and transition rates of your system, okay? So the transition rates, apart from that, I mean, as long as the transition rates fulfill this relation, um, they, they must fulfill this relation, but I mean, they can be anything. I mean, you know, the, the, there are lots of kinetic parameters that can influence transition rates. So, you know, uh, if I make, I, I can have similar chemical reactions or I can have different enzymes. If I, for example, different enzymes, but they are operating the same solution, the delta mu is determined by the solution, right? By the concentrations of P and S in the solution. So if I do two different enzymes, the Ws will be will be constrained by the same relation, but they will be different because of kinetic parameters. Okay, because the kinetic parameters can depend on on many different things. All right. And just to be clear, if I, if I am in equilibrium, if I have the tail balance, then of course, if I have the tail balance, I would have W I J over W J I is equal to e to the power of minus beta. Ij minus Ai, okay. That is not generalized state balance. That's what we call detailed balance, okay. That will be the case of equilibrium. And clearly, if I have detailed balance, I mean this this product there, the W12, W23. I mean from this relation here, it's very easy to show that if I do W12, W23, W31, W21, W32. And W13, that's going to be equal to one. Okay, it's not hard to show that. I mean, if my my the ratio of the transition rate, transition rates is just the exponential of energy difference, then when I complete the full cycle, I start at one, but I go back to one. I'm going to have nothing left, right? That's going to give me e to the power of zero because it's always an energy difference. Okay, if it's not always an energy difference, then I'm going to get something that's no zero, okay? So again, generalized detailed balance is not really detailed balance, though those are different things. The detailed balance means that um, if I look at any cycle in my system, the product of the forward rates divided by the product of the backward rates is going to give me uh, one, okay? And generalized detailed balance is just a relationship between um, transition rates and the thermodynamic parameters. Now, you know, if you have more cycles, then each cycle is going to have a different thermodynamic force. They might have the same force, depends. But, you know, this will be true for all cycles in your network, okay? They're always going to be related to each of the power of some thermodynamic force, okay? This thing here, the delta mu or the beta delta mu, this thing here is typically called a force or a thermodynamic force or another name is affinity, okay? Those are things, those are the things, those are the physical parameters that drive you out of equilibrium, okay? If delta mu is zero, the system is in equilibrium. If delta mu is different from zero, the system is out of equilibrium. And in general, I mean, the, the main difference that will happen in general models is that they will have many, many different cycles, okay? They don't have to be just a single cycle like this three-state model, it's very simple, but they can have many, many cycles. And, you know, Again, if I think about a system with like 10 enzymes, for example, which is still a very small system, right? Just 10 enzymes. Or if you think about 100 enzymes, then, you know, the number of cycles is going to become something really complicated. Where there, will be, there will be many, many different cycles. Uh, but it's still, this rule will still be true. I mean, if I do a cycle, if I'm in equilibrium, uh, this product is always going to be, this, this ratio is always going to be one. And if I'm out of equilibrium, it's going to be given by e to the power of the affinity associated with that cycle, okay? Okay, now let's think about entropy. And again, 
I discussed the generalized state balance within the three state model. And I also uh, want to discuss uh, entropy. So this is six, right? Yeah, six entropy change of the medium. When I say medium, I mean the external medium, okay? That's the entropy change of the external reservoir. So let's say again, I go through the cycle. So I go from, let's say I go through the sequence of transitions. I start at E plus S, then I go to S, then I go to P, and then I go to E plus P. Now, what is the entropy change of the medium, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna calculate this entropy change of the medium using standard thermodynamics because, you know, the medium is in equilibrium. So standard thermodynamics should be valid for the medium, like, you know, uh, and then I'm gonna connect this uh, change. I'm gonna show that this change of, or I'm gonna calculate this change of entropy of the medium in terms of transition rates. Because what I really wanna do in, in, in stochastic thermodynamics is to have a formula for the entropy change of the medium in terms of the transition rates, okay? And all I'm doing here is that if I assume that the tape balance is true, okay? If I, if I postulate the tape balance, then this entropy change of the medium is gonna be consistent with standard thermodynamics. That's what I'm gonna demonstrate here, okay? Which again is very rarely demonstrated in papers in the literature. Very few papers do that, okay? It's not so common. Now, let's think about what's entropy in standard thermodynamics. Remember this formula, we have DS is one over T du. I hope you have seen this formula. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to follow. P of T dv uh, minus mu over T dn, OK? You know, S would be a function of u, d, and n, right? And you know, this means that the derivative of S with respect to u is going to be 1 over t. The derivative of F with respect to v is going to be p over t. And uh, the derivative of S with respect to n is going to be mu over t or minus mu over t, okay? Okay, so that's the formula for S, right? In our case, we have two n, so we would have to write minus mu p over t dnp, okay? Again, this is a standard formula from thermodynamics. If you remember your course in thermodynamics, you saw this kind of formula, okay? Okay, so let's think about the cycle above. What is the delta S of the cycle above, okay? So for this cycle here, and when I say this cycle here, I mean this cycle. So if I went from E back to E, taking a superset that goes from P here, of course the du, the, the energy change, that's going to be zero. And this term also is going to be zero, so I don't care about that. So let's think about the delta S. Delta S is going to be minus mu S. Now the delta N S is going to be minus one because I took an S from the solution. So before I had an S and I took an S from the solution, then I have minus mu P and the delta S of the P is plus one because I added so, you know, this here is delta n s, and this here is delta n p, okay? So my delta s, and that's delta s of the medium, is going to be simply divided by t, I forgot. Remember that kb is equal to 1 here, okay? So my delta s is going to be simply beta mu s minus mu p, okay? Again, the reservoir, the medium is in equilibrium, okay? So this formula is true because the system is not in equilibrium, but the medium is in equilibrium. So if the medium is in equilibrium, standard thermodynamics must be true for the medium, okay? So that is, the, I mean, I can just use the standard formula of thermodynamics. And what I conclude by using standard thermodynamics is that if I go through the cycle, then the entropy change of the medium 
must be this thing here. But at the same time, from generalized state balance, what we saw is that W, one, two. So again, the, 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 the cycle is one, two, 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 three, and three, two, one, okay? One is E, two is ES, and three is EP. And the generalized state balance condition was that W, two, three, W, three, one, over W2, one, W3, two, W1, three. That was equal to each of the power of beta delta mu, okay? But as you can see, this is exactly the same as exponential of the delta S of the medium. So basically, if I do this cycle here, one back to one, the delta S M associated with this cycle would be ln of w12, w23, w31, w21, w32, and w13, okay? So you know, that's something that is not commonly done in the literature. I'm justifying the relationship between delta S and, I mean, how do you justify the formula for the entropy change of the medium uh, in terms of the uh, transition rates. And that's the formula for the entropy change. So in general, I mean, if I go from state I to state J, the entropy changing associated with going from state I to state J is delta SM, we can call this IJ. It's gonna be LN of WIJ over W. Ji, okay? So again, that's a formula that is postulated in stochastic thermodynamics, but the reason for the formula is that, you know, if you assume the state balance or generalized state balance is true, okay? If you ask, which is a postulate again of the theory. So if, and you know, this is something that you can verify in experiments. I mean, you can, you can measure these transition rates, right, in principle in, in different kinds of experiments. And you can check whether this postulate is going to be true or not. And it is true, okay? So sometimes in chemistry, people would call something like this, or not exactly like this, but, you know, something that will lead to this mass action law. Again, it's something that people have observed in, in chemical reactions with enzymes. Uh, but, you know, also in other things, you can, you can observe it, and it's always true. But if you assume generalized state balance is true, then this formula here for the entropy, okay, this definition of, entropy change of the medium, which is a very important formula in stochastic thermodynamics, how I define the entropy change of the medium from my state, going from my state I to a state J, is consistent with the standard definition of entropy in thermodynamics, which is this one, okay? That's what I did. So I start with the standard definition of entropy in, in, in thermodynamics, not even stochastic thermodynamics. So I, I know my reservoir is in equilibrium, so that must be my entropy change. Then, uh, by using generalized state balance, we arrive at the conclusion that delta SM must be equal to that. So I did not really assume this equation is true. I derived this equation here, okay? And basically this equation here is consistent with the definition of entropy, which is just ln of WAJ over WGI. So, you know, if you have written anything about stochastic thermodynamics, you have seen that the rate of entropy production, sigma, okay? Is going to be the sum over all states ij, pi, wij, ln of wij over wj. Okay, that's the in the steady states case. Okay, so that would be the rate of entropy, entropy production. And of course, this formula comes from this thing here, right? Once, once I know that for each transition ij, the entropy change is ln of wij over wji, if I want to calculate the average entropy change, I must make an average over all my transition rates and multiply by the respective stationary probability i, right? That's the rate of entropy production at a stationary state, okay? And you know, this, I mean, for the particular model here, uh, if I calculate the sigma, that's going to be simply delta mu, beta delta mu, multiplied by the current J, okay? Remember that J is equal to the J12, right? The current between one and two, which is equal to the J23, which is equal to the J23. 
three one. Okay, it's not very hard to go from this formula to this one. Okay, they are equivalent. This is a more physical formula, right? The rate of entropy production is the entropy change associated with a cycle multiplied by the rate at which you know, J gives the rate at which I do cycles. Okay, the net rate at which I do cycles, and this is the entropy change associated with each cycle. And by entropy change, I mean the medium entropy change, okay? So, you know, that's the definition of entropy in stochastic dynamics. Again, this is a formula that you've probably seen somewhere. And what I did here is a physical justification for this formula, showing that it's in complete agreement with the standard definition of entropy in standard thermodynamics, okay? And what is really important for this definition to I mean, this ln of Wij over Wji to be correct or to be really an entropy, a physical entropy, is that you assume that the generalized state balance is true, which is again a postulate of the theory. It's typically called generalized state balance condition. It's not really a condition. It is more like a postulate. It's more like a relationship between transition rates and thermodynamic parameters. All right. So. Okay, that's the formula for the average entropy production. Now I want to move towards talking about the fluctuation theorem. And for that, I will have to talk about stochastic trajectories. I'm not sure I will be able to finish this in this lecture, but let's start with stochastic trajectories at least. Anybody, anybody want to make questions about uh, generalized state balance or anything before it starts stochastic trajectories? Don't hesitate to ask question. Uh, yeah, I have one. Yes. Can, can, you you, can you give your name for me? Yes, I, I'm Javier, can you listen to me? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, sorry, I got lost in the, when you wrote the, the second equation for the entropy production, the, the, more, the, the one that is more physical, is the last equation you wrote. Which one? For the entropy production, the rate, the rate of change of entropy, sorry, sigma. This one yes. here? Yeah, okay. the J. Yeah, I got lost with the J because, we, and you repeat what, what was the J there? J was uh, P1S W12 minus P2S W21. That was the J. And which is equal to J23, J31. They are all the same. No, you are not imposing equilibrium there? No. Sorry? No, OK, OK, no, OK, OK. Nothing, nothing. Okay. Thank you. OK. I mean, I do. I, I would have to demonstrate how to go from here, from there to there. But it's, you know, that's something that probably it's good to leave as an exercise. You should try. So it's a good exercise to go from here to there. All you have to assume is this. So if you assume this thing here is true, OK? If you assume this is true, then again, if you assume generalized state balance, you should be able to go from this equation above to the equation below. OK, so Sorry, uh, one to... question. Yeah, sure. So I just want to make sure if I understand. So J, the current, uh, can be either sign. Right in non-equilibrium, it could be their sign. Yes, yes. But so, I, I'm a, yeah, sir, tell me. So, so rate of entropy production could be positive or negative. No, if if the j is negative, the delta mu is also negative. So the j can only be negative if the delta mu is also negative. Oh, I see. Okay, so, so it's the, correlated. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. The, the the sigma is always larger than zero. Okay, that's for sure. Okay, so, but I mean, the reason I don't talk about a negative J is just that, I mean, you know, when you have two chemical things like in a solution like this, okay, if you wanna call something a substrate and something a product, typically calling something a substrate means that the chemical potential of that thing is gonna be larger than the other one, okay? You know, if I was, if I was to think about a negative delta mu, I probably should call the PS and the SP, all right? So, but you know, if you, if you want to think about the negative way, also everything works the same way. It doesn't really change much. Okay, so I'm going to talk about stochastic trajectories. For that, the first thing I'm going to do is to discretize time. So we need to do discrete time to make our life simpler. All right, so let's think about 
the master equation in discrete time. Okay, so what I'm thinking about when I tell you that I want to discretize time. So the master equation is dp dt is equal to wp. And so if I discretize time with a step delta, okay, that's the size of my step, my discretization of time, I can write this equation as p of t plus delta minus p of t over delta is equal to w p of t. And you know, I can write this equation as p of t plus delta is equal to i yeah, identity matrix plus delta w p of t. All right. And you know, the limit of delta going to zero, I will recover continuous time. Okay. Now, the reason I'm discretizing time is that if I do stochastic trajectories with discrete time, it's just they are simpler than doing the ones with continuous time. But, you know, if I prove something to be true for discrete time, then it's immediately true for continuous time. So, discrete time is kind of a more general case. Okay. So, if a proof works for discrete time, then for sure it must be true for continuous time. Okay. Assuming the limit is the limit is well behaved, which you know it's going to be the case anyway. So, but you know, uh, we are going to do stochastic trajectories in discrete time, just because they are simpler. And the the rationale here it is if I prove, for example, the fluctuation theorem is true with uh, discrete time trajectories, then it must be true for continuous time. Okay, and so I can call this matrix here M. Okay, and okay, so remember how the matrix look. It's this matrix will look like this. So I have one minus delta R1, uh, delta W1. No, that's two one, two one, delta W31, delta W12, delta W13, one minus delta R2. One minus delta R three, delta W one three, delta W two. No, that should not be one three. That should be three two, right? And that is two three. All right. Okay, so this is my matrix is gonna look like. Now this matrix, you know, but remember that the matrix W, the sum of the elements in a column is zero. For this one, if I sum the elements in a column, I'm gonna get one, okay? So if I sum, if I sum, what I mean is if I sum this one with this one, with this one, I'm gonna get one, all right? That's also called a stochastic matrix, but that's a stochastic matrix for discrete time, okay? And basically, if I look at the transpose matrix, so M transpose from I to J is, the transition probability from I to J, okay? Before it was a transition rate, right? The WIJ is a transition rate. So, you know, the WIJ has dimension T to the power of minus one, T being time, okay? while the Mij transpose, the transpose of the matrix is gonna be really a transition probability. So it has it has no dimension, okay? It's just really a transition probability. And so, you know, as long as I make my delta small enough, this is a consistent thing. And if I do my delta, my delta must be small such that all diagonal elements are positive, okay? The diagonal elements cannot be negative. Um, so the minimal delta or the biggest delta I can do is such that all elements in the diagonal remain positive, okay? But if I want to, if I'm thinking about the continuous limit, I imagine some sort of small delta limit, okay? And uh, yeah, that's just an equivalent description. But basically, the elements I'm going to use to construct a stochastic trajectory in discrete time are going to be these elements here, which give the transition probability from I to J, okay? Now let's imagine a stochastic trajectory in discrete time. Again, I mean, the matrix changed a little bit, but it's pretty much the same as the old story. So the maximum gain value of this matrix is not going to be zero anymore. It's going to be one. 
But then it's also a home for open matrix. Okay, all other eigen values have uh, smaller eigen values. Then it's the same kind of rationality that I explained before with continuous time matrix. Okay, that's just some sort of exponentially decaying solution, and you start at some initial probability go to the end one. By the way, the stationary probability of this matrix is going to be the same as the continuous time one. Okay, if I build it like that, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we discretize the time now. We're going to think about a stochastic trajectory. And, you know, a big point in stochastic thermodynamics is that things like entropy, heat, work, whatever, they are all defined as functionals of a stochastic trajectory. Okay, so that's why I'm talking about stochastic trajectory here. After I talk about stochastic trajectory, I want to define entropy as a function of the stochastic trajectory. After that, I'm going to prove the fluctuation theorem. Okay, that's the order of things here. Okay, so the first thing you are doing is to simply talk about stochastic trajectory. So what's a stochastic trajectory? It's just a sequence of transitions. Okay, so let's say a stochastic trajectory gamma. Oh, that's going to be stochastic trajectory. Is going to be equal to, you know, x0, x1, x2, up to xn, okay? So it has any transitions, okay? If I think about the time, the time associated with this stochastic trajectory would be delta multiplied by n, okay? That's the total time, n is the number of jumps. So the total time is fixed, you know, x zero. So remember I have states, I'm calling states i, j, right? And they are, you know, equal to one, two, up to omega. Okay, that's my system. That's what that's the notation I use it. So I have omega states. So for example, for the enzyme model, I had one, two, and three as the states, right? And so these x zeros are states. Okay, so you know x zero could be either anything from one to omega x one also, and so on and so forth. Okay. Again, if you want to think physically about the stochastic trajectory, so if you want to think about the molecular motor, it could be simply the position of the motor, and also you know you also may might have to account for conformational changes in the motor. If you think about the colloidal particle, it's simply the trajectory of the particle in space. If you think about the enzyme that I'm talking about, so that would be just a sequence of states, right? It would be from E to ES to EP. Maybe I stay in the same state and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the stochastic trajectory. So the X's here are just states, okay? They are just I, they can either be I, J, or whatever. Okay, so that's a stochastic trajectory, okay? All right. Now, we can also, we can, we're gonna think about what's the probability of a stochastic trajectory. Well, that's very simple. It's just the initial probability, let's say P of X zero. Then I have the transition probability, which is M transpose. Remember this thing here, it's the transition probability from I to J. So I have M transpose from X0 to X1. Then I have M transpose from X1 to X2 up to M transpose from X N minus one XN, okay? Or, I mean, this is equal to P X0 product from N equals to zero up to N minus one empty of xn, xn plus one, okay? That's the formula for a stochastic trajectory. Maybe next lecture, I'll talk about what happens in continuous time. But I mean, the reason I'm using discrete time is that, you know, if I was to use continuous time, I would have this, this sort of transition probability or transition rate from one stage to another. But I would also have uh, contributions from waiting times, okay? There are no waiting times when I discretize times. So that's why it's much simpler, okay? Now let's think about, well, no, let's think about something else first. Let's think about the reverse trajectory. The reverse trajectory simply means that you start in state Xn, then you go to state Xn plus minus one, and then you go to state x1 and you finish in state x0, okay? That's the reverse of trajectory.
So that's the reverse of gamma. All right. Okay, so that will be the reverse of the gamma and the probability of gamma reversed is simply gonna be P of Xn product from N equals to zero up to N minus one transpose of X n plus one to X n. Okay. I guess everybody can accept that. So you know, I, I would have the probability of, of going from X n to X n minus one, and so on and so forth. Now you know, in general, in stochastic thermodynamics, these transition probabilities here can depend on time. Okay, but for simplicity here, I'm assuming they do not depend on time. So I'm just going to write that empty could. depend on time, which would mean that for the continuous time process that my transition rates depend on time, okay? So my WIJs would also depend on time, okay? But the, I'm assuming that there is no time dependence just for simplicity. Things change a little bit if there is a time dependence, but I'm assuming that nothing, the transition rates or the transition probabilities do not depend on time, okay? Okay, so that's the probability of the trajectory and that's the probability of the inverse trajectories and now, I want to connect, I want to think about definitions of entropy in terms of stochastic trajectories. Well, let's create a new section for that. So basically I define what's a trajectory. One thing I should say is the following. So, I mean, if you think about this matrix here, okay, that's the matrix for the case of a three state model. Now, if Delta is very small, then of course the diagonal elements are much larger than the off diagonal ones, okay? So, you know, this probably, these three numbers here, if delta is small, this number here, this number here, and this number here are going to be close to one, while the diagonal, the off diagonal elements are going to be close to zero. So, what does this mean for a trajectory? For a trajectory, it means that, you know, it's much more likely that I do not change the states, that, you know, for when I go from x0 to x1, I stay in the same state, then that I would change a state. So, you know, Typically, it would take me a certain number of jumps uh, to calculate, to change a state, okay? And, but of course, if I don't change a state, um, well, we are gonna talk about this later, but again, when when I go from one state to another, X0 to X1 for X2, it, the more likely situation is that I did not change a state, okay? After some number of jumps, I'm gonna change a state, all right? And so, you know, in order to see a substantial number of changes in state, I, I have to take this n to be very large, okay? Which is typically gonna be the case, right? If delta is very small, then I need a very large n to make a finite time. Like, let's say I want my time to be 10 seconds, whatever. Then uh, if delta is small, I need a very large number n to, to arrive at 10 seconds, if, if my time is 10 seconds, all right? Okay, so uh, that's the probability of a trajectory and that's the probability of a reverse trajectory, okay? Those are the two formulas that we will need going forward. Okay, so now we want to talk about eight entropy as a functional. of stochastic okay so you know my definition of entropy was that the delta s environment associated with ij was equal to ln of w i j over w j i okay and that, of course, is going to be consistent with ln of m transpose ij over m transpose ji, okay? If i is equal to j, that's just zero, okay? If i and j are the same state, which again, if I look at a stochastic trajectory, as I told you, when I go from x0 to x1, I have the same state. 
the entropy change when I do a jump in a stochastic trajectory is typically going to be zero. So, you know, if I is equal to J, WIJ equal to J does not exist. There's no such thing as WAI, okay, II. That, that, that there is no such thing as a transition race from my state to itself. But when I do discrete time, then I can think about transition probability of staying the same state. Okay, those are a little bit of a different issues. If I is different from J, of course, that's going to be the same, right? This would be, you know, delta WIJ, and the other one is going to be delta WJI, and so they are the same. Okay, so the delta S of the environment associated with a jump from I to J is simply going to be uh, the log of either WIJ over WJI or of the transition probability from I to J divided by the transition probability from J to I, okay, which is the transpose of the matrix M. Now, um, if I want to write the delta S environment of the whole trajectory, gamma, Okay, that's simply going to be ln of m transpose of xn to xn plus one over m transpose of xn plus one xn. All right, and then I can sum from n equals to zero up to n minus one. Okay, so that's the definition of the entropy change. And I, I wrote environment, I should keep the notation as before, which was medium, sorry. So that's the entropy change of the external medium. So, you know, again, I'm, I wanna think about the stochastic trajectory for each, um, for each trajectory I have, okay? So this, of course, this entropy change of the medium can be negative. While the average one or the average rate of entropy production that we discussed before was always positive, this one here could be negative, okay? So if, for example, my trajectory, if you think about the single enzyme, if my trajectory would be a cycle, not in the clockwise, but in the anti then the entropy change associated with that particular cycle, which unlikely would be negative, okay? So for a particular trajectory, the delta SM can be negative, all right? Now, that is the entropy change of the environment. What's the entropy change of the system? Well, the entropy change of the system associated with gamma is simply going to be defined as minus ln of p xn plus ln of p x zero. All right. And you know, if you think about if I take the average of delta s of the system, all right, average means so. You know, here average simply means some, so average of something will be something that depends on gamma, P of gamma, okay? P of gamma being the probability. So I should call this, let's just make this clear here. This means sum over O gamma delta S system of gamma probability of the trajectory gamma, okay? That's that's what the brackets mean there. So, I mean, I'm defining my entropy change of the system in this way. And all I wanna say is that this is simply the channel entropy, okay? If I take the average, this definition, this is gonna give me uh, sum over all states, possible states, xn, ln minus, and I'm sorry for this notation, it's not ideal, but PXN uh, plus zero, PX zero, a line of PX zero. So my point is that this definition here is consistent with channel entropy, okay? And I hope you have heard about channel entropy in your life. But I mean, again, the system is an out of equilibrium system. And you know, pretty much the most natural definition you can imagine for an out of equilibrium system of entropy. I cannot define entropy in the thermodynamic sense that I had before, like ds is equal to TDU or one over TDU and so on and so forth. That doesn't work anymore. My system is out of equilibrium. And so my definition of entropy of the system is um, that the entropy of the system is just the channel entropy, okay? And so if I define the trajectory entropy like this, if I take the average of the trajectory entropy, what I'm gonna get is the channel entropy at the end minus the channel entropy in the beginning. So it might be convenient to write this 
is minus minus. Okay. Well, you know, this this would be the channel entropy at initially, and the other one is the channel entropy at the beginning. So you know, if you don't know the definition of channel entropy, would be this thing here. Okay. That would be the channel entropy at the end. All right. And this one here would be the channel entropy in the beginning. Okay. So. Now I have my entropy change of the medium. I have my entropy change of the system. And I also have this equation here for the probability of a four stochastic trajectory and the probability of the reverse stochastic trajectory, okay? Now, if I think about the total entropy change as a function of the trajectory gamma, that's gonna be the delta S of the median as a function of gamma plus the delta S of the system as a function of gamma, okay? Okay, so again, I have to choose, let's call this equation here one, this equation here two, this equation here, I'm calling it three, and this equation here, I'm calling it four, okay? If you put all of them together, it's not gonna be very hard to show that the delta S total of gamma is gonna be equal to ln of the probability of gamma divided by the probability of gamma reversed, okay? That is a really, really important form of stochastic thermodynamics. And again, I start with this definition of entropy. Entropy of the medium is the one that I justify with generalized state balance. Entropy of the system is just the channel entropy of the system, okay? And if we fit these definitions, what I find is that the entropy, the total entropy, okay, thought means total entropy, the entropy of the medium, the change of the entropy of the medium plus the change of the entropy of the system is going to be given by the log of the probability of the forward trajectory divided by the probability of the reverse trajectory. And now from this equation, we can derive the fluctuation theorem, which is the following. So let's say I want to calculate e to the power of minus delta s total. Right. That's going to be equal to the sum uh, over all trajectories gamma, the probability of a trajectory gamma, e to the power of minus delta s total of gamma. Right. Now, if I use the formula above, that's going to give me sum over gamma, probability of gamma, probability of gamma reversed over probability of gamma. This one cancels this one out. And of course, if I sum over all gamma, it's the same as sum over all gamma reversed. For each trajectory gamma, there is only one reversed trajectory, right? There's a one corresponding reversed trajectory, which means that, you know, if I sum over gamma or sum over gamma R is the same, and this thing is the probability, so it must be one, right? It must be normalized to one. So basically, e to the power of minus delta as total, is equal to one, okay? That is the very famous fluctuation theorem. It, it takes different names, Jasinski quality. I'm gonna discuss this next lecture, the interpretation or the physical interpretation of this thing. But, you know, a main thing about the fluctuation theorem is that it's a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what's the second law of thermodynamics is that delta S total average must be larger or equal to zero, okay? So, you know, e to the power of minus delta S total equals to one must be larger than e to the power of minus average delta S total, okay? This is called the NC inequality, okay? But this inequality is true, all right? That's, that's always true. It's called the NC inequality. It's something you can demonstrate. So basically from this relation, Okay, this is something I don't know yet, okay? But what I'm saying here is from this inequality, which is called the Ensign inequality together with the fluctuation theorem. So this thing here, one together with two, are gonna give me that delta S total larger than zero. So the fluctuation theorem is actually a generalization of the second law of thermodynamics, okay? It's a stronger statement in the second law of thermodynamics. Not only the entropy must be positive, but the entropy, if for example, I calculate the average of the exponential of the time that must be equal to one, okay? This is not really an inequality, it's an equality. It's a much stronger statement, all right? And I mean, this can be expressed in terms of the probability distribution of entropy. I'm gonna discuss a little bit about that uh, 
next lecture. I guess I can finish my lecture here. And you know, that's, I mean, once you understand this definition, okay, once you understand this definition, the derivation of the fluctuation theorem is really one line, okay, it's pretty straightforward. And you know, this is the result that really made uh, stochastic dynamics. That's that's the that's where the field was born. Again, this was obtained in the mid '90s. Different versions of it, and that's the very famous fluctuation theorem. All right. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much, Jose. Is there some question? Yes. I'm asking uh, Maybe come here, yeah, but maybe we will listen better. Hi. Uh, First, present yourself. Okay, so uh, I'm Sandeep and uh, I'm quite new in this topic. This is not my... Uh, Topic, uh, but I was uh, I wanted to know why one should go with the uh, entropy repro reproduction rate. What information it carries in general for a system? I mean, it, if you think about the single enzyme, it tells you how much how much chemical work you are. I mean, first it tells you whether you are out of equilibrium or not. Okay, if you are out of equilibrium, the reproduction rate is not zero. If you are in equilibrium your entropy production rate is zero. Now, it tells you, I mean, in general, it tells you how much, you know, energy you are dissipating or free energy you are consuming. So, you know, for many things we have to do, we have to dissipate energy. And you can think a lot, of, a lot about a lot of things in terms of, you know, if, if, for example, you do an engine, you want the engine to not dissipate too much energy, okay? Or you want to reach a very high efficiency. So all the heat you take from a hot reservoir, you want to transform, into work, that would mean that the entropy production rate is small in a sense. So, you know, it's something that it, it quantifies how much free energy you are consuming, the average entropy production rate. And, you know, in many situations, there are many things that you can only do if you consume energy, like in biology, for example, lots of things you have to consume energy, but it's in many situations, it's not clear why you could have to consume that energy. And, you know, in which sense, for example, the energy, energy consumption rate will be optimized. But ideally, you know, you want to be able to do whatever particular task you are doing with the minimal energy consumption, let's say. And, you know, if you want to analyze this kind of question, you have to look at the entry production rate. I guess that would be my answer. Okay. Andre, I saw also that there is many questions in the chat. Can you read them for me? Yeah, because you, do, you don't see the chat? I mean, I cannot. Now I can try to see. Uh, okay, can you repeat the idea when delta is small? So delta is small. It simply means that uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if this question was asked when I was talking about transitions being. So one thing is that delta is small. We co will correspond to the continuous time limit. Okay, so I discretize this time. And the other thing I said is that if I look at this matrix here, okay, uh, that's the matrix. When delta is small, I mean. It is more likely that I stay in the same state in a jump, right? One minus delta R1 is gonna be much, it's gonna be close to one, while delta, the, the off diagonal elements of my matrix are gonna be close to zero, and the diagonal elements of my matrix are gonna be close to one, which means that if I am in a certain state, it's more likely that I stay in that state than I jump out of that state, okay? That's what I, I said about delta. I hope that's answer the question. Uh, since the probability of the stochastic trajectory have the same structure as the standard stochastic trajectory, there is a time symmetry happening. Um, I mean, I would say that having an entropy that is positive means that there is some break of time symmetry in a sense, right? Then, uh, yes, I mean, the structure, probably the structure is not sufficient, yes. The structure, so, comes, the structure comes from Markov. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. There is a time symmetry happening. I think that he, the question is related to the fact that... Ah, they sure. Look, they I look mean, it, but, they, look, they look similar. The forward and backward. Yeah. So, so, so it, 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 if it looks similar, it means that there but, is a time symmetry. 
Yeah, but M, M being a symmetric, M is not a symmetric matrix. That's a different story comparing to symmetry in the trajectory. Well, I mean, both the four trajectory and the stochastic trajectory can be written in terms of a product of the transpose of the matrix M because it's just Markov process. That's one thing. The other thing is a symmetry time, which typically people would call symmetry time having no entry production, right? I mean, that's what people would call time symmetric, but those are different things. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the structure of the, I mean, the fact that the probability of the expression for the probability of the four trajectory and the expression for the probability of the various trajectory have the same structure, if you will, is just because it's a Markov process. That's it, nothing else. I think in the sense that you are asking. Is it answer to you, people which are in the chat? Well, yes. Okay, and people which ask that the cheat will will be in the web, website, yes. So I think that uh, we we put a PDF version. We will put a PDF version of the of the all this, of this lecture of Andre in the website. Lazar, you you, you will do. I can I can just send it. Ah, Erika, Erika will do. Okay, or I will do. Don't worry. Okay. And Is there uh, a question? Yeah. And I was just saying that we, we will do that. Yes. Come, come, come. Yeah, that is a supplementary question. Come. Present, mm. present you first. Huh? Present yourself first. Okay. Hello, I'm Jose. <laughs> uh, my question is um, in what cases can you give like a thermodynamic interpretation for the Shannon entropy? As you... Of the system. Yeah, yeah, that's here you relate the change in entropy in the well, I, I, yeah, with the I mean, change in the channel entropy, no? Yeah, but you can, I mean, do, you can do that always. Sure, I mean, it's it's just that, uh, so the system is not an equilibrium thing, okay? So I cannot talk about, I mean, for example, this relation ds is equal to one over t du uh, minus p over plus p over t dv minus mu over t dn. For the system, okay, that's simply not true. That's just not true. This doesn't work. It's a non-equilibrium system, so this is only true in equilibrium, okay? Uh, and so, you know, you, you uh, I mean, you want to think about some definition of entropy of the system, and you know, you, you might try to think another one, which is not Shannon. Maybe it works, maybe not. And by it works, I mean, you know, why would we define entropy? So what's the point of entropy in thermodynamics, if you will? The point of entropy, I mean, why the reason behind it is to define something that tells you the things that you can do from the things that you cannot do, okay? The fact that the entropy change is larger than zero will tell you, in standard thermodynamics even, it will tell you just the stuff that you can do from the stuff that you cannot do. For example, you cannot like, uh, you know, you think about uh, taking the elevator instead of, of exercising to lose weight, you just take the elevator, okay? You, you, would, you would like transform gravitational energy to burning calories with efficiency one. That's not possible. I mean, the first law conservation of energy will tell you, okay, you can do that. But the second law, you know, that does not work. It's impossible, okay? So the reason we define entropy is to tell, is, it, I mean, if you, if you come out with a quantity that there is an inequality and that will tell you things that you can do from things that you cannot do, and that does happen if I define the system entropy as the channel entropy, I do get something like that. So that's the reason for this definition. I would say that's the justification for it. But, you know, if you, I mean, what I would call thermodynamic entropy is something like this, okay? And, the, and since it's a non-equilibrium system, um, that's not really... I mean, this equation is simply not true anymore, okay? And, and that's just a definition that we use and, and it's a definition that makes sense, the sense that we end up with some quantity that can tell us things that we can do from things that we cannot do, right? That's how I would explain it, if it answers your question. Okay, okay, thank you. If there is another question, I want to assist also for the next uh, talk in this week. Or in the next week, you can ask all the questions that you want. You don't need to have shame. If the question is stupid, it's not a problem. Really. It's normal I to have question. It's normal to have stupid question. So is somebody have a question in the chat? Yes. Uh, the, is there any uh, stochastic thermodynamic uh, generalization of third law of thermodynamics? Yeah. Not really. No, third law, not really. I, I, I would go for a no for this one. Zero law, the... maybe people have thought about that, but third law, not really. Is that because zero temperature limit 
is in conflict with the, the assumption that this system is stochastic or something? Uh, I don't know. I never thought about it, but I mean, I mean, the system is stochastic, but you can always take a zero temperature limit. I mean, even in a normal thermodynamic system, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, okay. I never thought about third law in stochastic thermodynamics. I, I, I don't think it is the case. I think you, you might be able to do something like that. I don't know. But uh, to be honest, I never liked the third law very much. But I mean, even if the system is stochastic, I can at least take a limit, right? The temperature is there, it relates to the transition rates, and I could, in principle, try to take some limit of t going to zero. So that should work, and you know, I'll go to my whatever ground state or whatever. That should be possible to do, whether you get something like a third law or not. I never thought about it, but okay. you know, thank you. Something that haven't been discussed. Maybe, maybe you write a paper about it in the future, but I don't know. I don't know. So we have maybe a last question in the room. Hi, my name is Dana, and I was just wondering if the internal entropy production production is interesting in any any way. Like you kind of leave it out, right? Which entropy production? Uh, like the internal one. You say there's one of the medium, but what about the small mesoscopic system? Like uh, that also has. Yes. Like, yeah. So in a in a steady state, that's just zero. Right. Okay. I mean, I, did, I didn't really show that, but if you think about a steady state, which I was talking about most of the times here, uh, the steady state, it's just going to be zero. Yeah. All right. So for a steady state, it's just zero. If it's not steady state, then it might be, it's, re it's a relevant contribution that will show up in your total entropy change. Okay. Thank you. So, and Ed, Edgar said that someone wrote a paper about the third law, which I was not aware of, but I will read. So, in the next lecture of Andre, if you want, you can start by asking questions. Because you know, you know, you have probably you must work tonight for uh, understand what all you do, because this is a basis of stochastic dynamic. In a sense, it's an important lesson. So, I, I, I advise you to work a little tonight. And then tomorrow, at the beginning of his lecture, you can ask some question if you don't understand. And uh, you really, the question can be naive, it will be naive, no problem. So thanks, Andre. Now we will go to the next uh, section, which is this all on section. Lazar? Lazar, so thanks, Andre. That's a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. All right, now. <laughs>